Hey, hello. Uh, thanks for attending our latest cybersecurity webinar, Why Illinois Privacy and Cybersecurity uh, Developments Matter Nationwide. Uh, before we begin, we have a few housekeeping items to attend to. Uh, if you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. We'll try and answer them during the webcast if we are able to, but if there's a more complete answer th that's necessary or if we run out of time, uh, we'll answer it later by email. Uh, a copy of today's slide deck is available in the resource widget. Uh, I encourage you to download any resources or links that you might find useful about today's webinar. Uh, you can find additional answers to some common technical issues in the help widget at the bottom of the screen. Uh, today's uh, webinar is CLE accredited. Uh, it's, it's accredited in California, Illinois, and Texas for one hour of general credit, in Missouri for 1.2 hours of general credit, and in New York for one hour of professional practice, both experienced and transitional credit. Uh, we award CLE based on attendance for the entire 60 minutes. Uh, due to changes in jurisdictional requirements, we are no longer using automated pop-up attendance checks. As required, we display secret words in two multiple choice uh, polls during the, the webinar. Uh, you'll be required to select today's secret word from the uh, multiple choice list. So please respond to these two polls uh, quickly, if you can, uh, demonstrate your uh, continued engagement, earn your full CLE credit. Uh, our presenters will be on video today. Uh, please make sure your media player is open to view the, the video presentation. Uh, the media player is the red widget at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we your opinions and appreciate your participation in the course today. Uh, with that said, uh, we have, I, I'd like to introduce a, a great panel that we have to, to go over this topic today. Uh, this panel has experience and insights that you will not find anywhere else. Uh, I'm Jim Shreve. I chair the cybersecurity practice here at Thompson Coburn. I'm based here in the Chicago office as well as in the Washington DC office. And I've been handling privacy and cybersecurity developments for uh, almost 25 years now. Uh, and I do so for a variety of, of industries, including uh, financial services, higher education, government contractors, energy, uh, and, and so forth. Um, with that, I'll pass off to uh, my colleague, John Cullerton. Hello, everybody. My name is John Cullerton. I'm a partner here at Thompson & Coburn. Uh, I served in the Illinois General Assembly for 41 years. I resigned a couple uh, years ago. Uh, I was a Senate president for uh, 11 years. And just before I got to be Senate president, I was in the legislature when we uh, voted for uh, this piece of legislation we're going to discuss today. So. I hope to give you some insight as to the background and how it was uh, how it was passed. Hi everyone, I'm Drew Taylor Moore, a business litigation associate, also based out of Thompson Coburn Chicago office. I primarily specialize in commercial litigation, and as of late, um, that's often involved helping companies defend against privacy actions, uh, whether based in tort law or statute, such as some that we're going to discuss today. Happy to be here, Jim. Okay. Well, thanks for that. And so with that, let's start off at the beginning, at the, the, the highest level of Illinois law, uh, the, the state constitution, which interestingly enough and unusually includes provisions that go to privacy. Uh, Drew. So Illinois uh, is a trailblazer in many respects, but especially here, um, because as many of us uh, studied and found out about in constitutional law class, the Constitution itself on the federal side does not specifically or expressly uh, enumerate any privacy protections. Uh, the, a lot of those privacy protections were later implied uh, through uh, interpretation by Justice Harlan and other justices as, um, as our court um, proceeded to deal with actual cases in front of them. Uh, so we have another, a number of amendments on the federal side in which it's implied protection of privacy rights are found, such as the 14th Amendment, uh, the Fourth Amendment and others. But Illinois specifically implies uh, or actually expressly protects privacy rights in Article I, Section 6 of Illinois' Constitution and its Bill of Rights. And it provides basically that Illinois citizens are protected against the government's or state agencies or state actors' invasion of their privacy or interception of their private communication. Um, so, in a way, uh, these 
uh, this protection uh, is both more extensive and broader than what's available <clears throat> under the federal <clears throat> constitution because it's express, but in the, at the same time, it's also contained. It doesn't have a broad privacy protection, and it really is limited to uh, certain state actors impeding or intruding upon what you do. Another note is that in Illinois, we follow the limited lockstep doctrine approach under which if our constitution or some of our laws are more protective and broader than what's available under the federal grant of laws or protections, then Illinois courts will expand those protections when they're interpreting and deciding cases. Uh, in other states, they follow the lockstep doctrine where they might just entirely ignore their own state laws or state constitutions and just go ahead and follow uh, jurisprudence established by federal courts and the Supreme Court. Jim? Excellent. Well, well thank you. Um, so uh, with that, we, we have our first of the secret uh, secret word questions. And so uh, the, okay, oh, we, we've advanced past it. Okay, so, uh, we have three choices here. But what what is the? Sorry, why are we advancing here? Okay, so we, um, which of these is the secret word? Uh, okay, so okay, team people. Cannot see. Which, okay, oh, the secret word, oh, sorry, sorry, I see now. Okay, the secret word is fruit. Uh, so please choose uh, fruit from your three uh, multiple choice question, uh, answers here on the screen. Choose the word fruit here, please. So I'll give you a few moments to do that. Um, why it keeps jumping around on me? Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Um, so choose the word fruit, and then we will we'll move on. Uh, give you just another you know, five seconds or so. Choose fruit from the, the, the screen here, and then we'll move on. All right. We're, we're moving on. So um, we're... There are several privacy laws and, and cybersecurity laws we're going to talk about today. But when you're talking about privacy and security in Illinois, there is one law that, that is the, the elephant in the room, so to speak. Uh, the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act is, is a law that has rightly gotten a lot of uh, notice, both when, within Illinois and outside Illinois, um, and because it has been a, a a, a fountain for litigation, uh, and it's probably the the most litigated privacy law in in the United States. Uh, it has also served as the model to to limit and extend to other other laws and other legislation that's being considered in other states. Uh, this is a topic. If, you, if you've tuned into the cybersecurity webinars before, we talked about this uh, in in greater depth. Uh, so I'm not going to go into this significantly, but you know, what, what are the BIPA requirements? So it, it, what information to cover? It covers two defined terms. It covers biometric identifiers and it covers biometric information. Uh, these are both defined in the statute, and they include certain types of, of uh, biometric information um, that where you, you may or may not necessarily know the person to whom that biometric information relates, uh, which is an important distinction uh, that, and, and a unique one um, from f f in the litigation context. Uh, it covers private entities. Um, as is often the case, the, the law is, is written uh, to uh, not cover government entities uh, themselves, but to cover within the, the, the private industry. Um, you know, what are the requirements? So if you have biometric information, you're collecting biometric information, uh, what do you have to do? Well, the first thing is you have to have a written policy uh, that, that covers the, you know, the, the collection of that biometric information, has a retention schedule for that information, and then guidelines that govern when you're going to 
to delete that information when it's no longer needed. And there are specific requirements as to how long you can retain that information. Then um, maybe the most important uh, of the requirements right now, at least in litigation terms, is it requires the informed consent of the person to whom the biometric information relates. So you have to give them notice of the collection and the purpose for, for which you're collecting it, and then obtain a written and executed release for that collection and retention of, of biometric information. Um, we'll, we'll get into you know, why, why that has been important in the, the litigation context. Uh, there are also requirements that you cannot profit from a person's biometrics. Uh, it limits uh, the, the sharing of biometrics you know, with, with your, by the collecting entity and other, other entities. Um, BIPA has a private right of action for an aggrieved person. We'll get into what constitutes an aggrieved person. Um, that, that's another important concept here. And it includes statutory damages, $1,000 for uh, negligent violations of BIPA, $5,000 for intentional or reckless violations, you know, plus attorney's fees and other relief. So it's an important law. It's a, it was a, a land breaking, groundbreaking law. Um, so let, let's turn to John Culverton. John, you were in the legislature when this was enacted. What can you tell us about you know, how it came to be? Sure, this bill was introduced on Valentine's Day, 2008, some 14 years ago. And as you indicated, we were the first in the nation to, uh, to pass this bill. The, the, um, the impetus was from the ACLU. The ACLU was, uh, has uh, a presence in Springfield. I wouldn't say the, mo the most powerful lobbying entity down there, but this was a, a very interesting topic. Uh, the sponsor was a, a leader in the Illinois Senate, um, but what was even more interesting was that the co-sponsor was the Republican leader in the Illinois Senate. That's usually not not the case. And uh, when it uh, when it when it eventually passed the Senate, went over to the House and had a, a, again strong sponsorship. During the course of this legislation, which was um, amended a number of times, and so it was really uh, thoughtfully debated. Not one person voted no in committee, on the floor, uh, in either in either chamber, and of course the governor signed signed the bill. Uh, so um, the the sponsor, in fact, in the House, said that uh, it seemed interesting because this concept of biometric information was kind of new. Uh, I think she went to the Target and she was able to pay for something with her fingerprint, and she said, "Well, we better look into this." Um, the ACLU's concerns were uh, for people not to be targeted, people um, uh, not to be uh, photographed against their will. And so uh, I can tell you one thing, though, that, that there was never any emphasis on thinking about what was going to happen in terms of how this was going to be enforced through uh, litigation in, in the future. That, that was not something that was really uh, discussed. Um, later on, when the Supreme Court had to consider it, they had to go back and look at legislative intent. And uh, you can't do that retroactively without limiting yourself to the debate in the, uh, in the chamber. And uh, this was not the, the, the focus. The, the amendments that were passed were concerns about, um, as you said, the government uh, worried about the Secretary of State's office saying, well, we're or law enforcement, we got people's fingerprints, and hope they're not covered by this. That sort of thing was, was what the debate was about, uh, not um, what, what would come out, uh, turn out to be, a, 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 as was indicated earlier, something the subject of great litigation. In fact, from what I, I believe, there was no litigation involved in this lawsuit, in this, this legislation for, for the first seven years of its, of its existence. Uh, it was kind of interesting that it was actually even passed um, in overtime session in the Senate, the Senate came back to finish passing the budget, and uh, this wasn't even the most important bill. It was signed by Governor Blagojevich about three um, months before he got impeached and uh, later on convicted. So that's how long ago this thing uh, was passed in the General Assembly, um, and uh, it's still viewed as one of the strictest in, in the nation. No, thanks. Thanks, John. I, I think I would point out, you know, looking, at, looking at the you know, broader context outside of Illinois, 
is that issues of privacy can create interesting coalitions, um, is that quite obviously there's a bit of partisanship in, in all legislatures these days. And privacy is an area where you can often get you know, the, the, the farthest on the left agreeing with the, the farthest on the right and, and seeing some of the issues here in very similar ways. And, and, and if there's uh, a different view, oftentimes it comes from in the middle of the spectrum, the, the more moderates. Um, so, and we've, we've seen, you know, so here in Illinois, this is an example of where we, we had the left and the right agree. Um, and there wasn't even much opposition uh, of, of any kind here. Um, but it, it does show that th this is an area where you can have bipartisanship, and as we, we saw in the enactment of BIPA. Um, so it, now we, we've enacted BIPA. It sat for uh, about seven years, it, it essentially unused. Um, but then it starts to get picked up on as a vehicle for litigation. Um, Drew, you want to talk about some of the issues that have come up in uh, litigating BIPA? Yeah, of course. Uh, we just mentioned this was one of the first laws of its land, one of the first laws uh, tackling the issue of biometric privacy. And because it was the first, of course, there were certain issues that the, le uh, the legislators just didn't think of or anticipate. And uh, the first one um, that I'll address is uh, the enforcement mechanism. So generally speaking, laws, statutes, they're enforced by either the attorney general or private rights of action or both or some other combination, maybe an agency is enforcing it. <clears throat> but BIPA... Um, just creates a private right of action for any citizen to come and bring a claim that one of BIPA's provisions have been violated. Uh, and what this means on the practical level is that we've seen an explosion of class actions um, in a number of contexts. Uh, BIPA, from the legislative purpose that's in the statute itself, it's really uh, the t detailing a consumer protective purpose. But a lot of these class actions that we're seeing, uh, I think there are probably thousands of them now, they are involved employer employee BIPA claims. And so what I mean is there are employees who use the timekeeping device that had a fingerprint scan or a handprint scan functionality enabled on them. Those employees use that scan and then they went ahead later on and initiated a private civil lawsuit against their employer. Um, we've seen it in a number of contexts where the employee is still with the employer, they're still employed. Uh, and then we've also seen the other context where the employee is disgruntled and this is, they find out about BIPA from maybe a very enterprising plaintiff's counsel or maybe they read about it online somewhere. And then you see this lawsuit um, and the lawsuits, as far as we're concerned, um, they're very difficult to start at the motion to dismiss stage. So we're looking at private lawsuits on the civil side that are very difficult to get get um, dismissed or uh, even knock out. Um for most of the defenses that we have under Illinois law. And that's the first litigation issue we're really looking at. This is one of those claims that doesn't go away easily um, unless you have a real slam dunk argument like statute of limitations expiration, or even um, as we'll discuss later, some form of informed consent as Jim mentioned before. And now when we're talking about the second um, bullet point here, agreed person need for harm. So this is very interesting because we go back into some elements of constitutional predicates for what a plaintiff litigant needs to actually get in court and stay there. So usually in order to get your case in court, you have to prove up your claim. And that claim under most of our constitutional requirements, that claim requires actual damages or a distinct and palpable uh, injury or imminent harm. Something that is showing that your injury is beyond the speculative. It's something that is going to happen or has already happened. And in the context of BIPA, you can imagine it's a privacy claim. We're talking about personal data. This could easily be a data breach. And we've seen the news over the last couple of years where even government agencies have been targeted uh, by nefarious individuals who are trying to get access to the sensitive data. Um, normally, this data has been like social security numbers. Um, but when we're talking about biometrics, what we are really talking about is the contact, the concept that this is the type of data that the government ag a government agency can't go in and change. You can't easily track it. It is specifically and very uniquely identified to a person. Um, so there was a major case called Rosenbach versus Six Flags Great Adventure um, that was decided a couple of years ago that 
really put a lot of defense uh, counsel on the back foot. So in 2019, yes, just three years ago, um, the Supreme Court was hearing a case in which a mother and her son were in six, a Six Flags amusement park. Uh, the amusement park installed fingerprint scan machines to enable you to more easily move through the park and get to rides. Um, and they did that not knowing that BIPA's requirement, um, BIPA was enacted, first of all, and they also did not know that one of BIPA's requirements was to get a release and informed consent before you collected biometrics in the first place. Um, so when this case before the Supreme Court, what was interesting about the holding was that they said you're an aggrieved person with standing to bring a lawsuit in court regardless of actual injury. So basically, as soon as you, as soon as a private entity failed to comply with BIPA's requirements, the person whose data they collected was an aggrieved person under the statute. Um, and this leads back to what I'm talking about with the private right of action, because anybody could be an aggrieved person, you know, if a private entity engaged in a hyper-technical violation. Um, this is where you see the explosion of lawsuits. Uh, Rosenbach is also interesting because that's really on the consumer side. So we're looking at the purchase of a service, you know, going into an amusement park, having fun. Um, but I mentioned before that a lot of these claims involve, involve employer-employee claims, which involve the use of biometrically enabled time clocks, security locks, things of that nature. So when we're looking at this definition of who the agreed person is and the lack of the need for harm, we're not looking at data breaches. We're not even necessarily looking at disclosure in some instances, what we're looking at is that the employer or the private entity didn't post the notice or the rec or retain the requisite release in the first place. Um, this is also an inter it presents an interesting contrast because in federal court, you usually have to, when you're the plaintiff, you need to satisfy Article Three standing requirements. You know, that's a pleading requirement. Most of us plead it when we're filing our complaints in federal court. Um, so we become very familiar with that. That standard is not applicable uh, on the Illinois state court side. Um, on that end, uh, especially when we are dealing with BIPA claims, what ha ends up happening is that it's the defendant who has to plead the lack of standing as an affirmative defense. So in some ways, the bar is lower. A plaintiff can just go ahead and file and is now incumbent upon the defendant not only to know that they have to assert this affirmative defense or lose or risk losing it or waiving it, but they also have to know what the claim is and be prepared to defend it. Um, so when we're, go when we're thinking about a grief person, just think about in the broadest method possible. And if you're representing a company, just think of the idea that anybody that you interact with who interacts with the biometrically enabled system could potentially bring a claim, which is why it's very important to make sure that you're compliant with uh, BIPA's requirements. Now, the next section is one that's near and dear to me. This one is statutory damages. So <laughs> Jim mentioned before that BIPA's damage scheme really depends upon culpability. So you either, you pay one or another amount based upon whether or not uh, the defendant was negligent or intentionally or recklessly violative of BIPA's requirements. Um, but the way the statute is uh, structured, it's supposed to be the actual of, the greater of actual damages or those liquidated damages amount that Jim mentioned before. So what we're looking at from what I've seen in the last couple of years of litigating these cases, there has never been a plaintiff who's actually come and presented actual damages. And it's very rare that data breaches in the context of a BIPA claim have ever happened. So what we're looking at are plaintiffs coming in, they have no injury, there's no harm, they're relying exclusively on the liquidated damages scheme to prove up what they can recover. And just combined with what we're talking about before, about the private right of action and agreed person, that causes a lot of problems. And I think the main problem is just the multiplicative, multiplicative nature of how quickly these damages can accrue. Um, so when we're talking, uh, moving on to accrual and damage calculations, first of all, you could easily be in a situation where, let's say we go with the lowest bar, the negligent violations, 1,000 per violation of BIPA. Uh, let's say you're an employer with 20 employees. These employees come in every day. They agree to scan. They've received training. And I guess in exchange for using that system and working for you, you provide them with a paycheck. It seemed like there's all sorts of implied consent um, as well as notice. And in some ways, like some sort of release implicit in an employment agreement, some of those factors seem to be there. But technically, when we're looking at whether or not that claim could proceed, it can't. 
that employee is still an agreed person if the employer didn't provide the right notices or the correct re- or obtain the correct releases. And then when we're looking at how those damages jump up, you're looking at employees where the employer can quite plausibly assert that there was some sort of implied consent. But now we're looking at an employer who's facing twenty thousand dollars of damages for let's just say one violate one scan that's violating FIPA's requirements per day. Now, if you just go through the multiplication exercise, it gets really ridiculous really quickly, um, especially when you consider there are around 260 business working days in the year. Most of the time when we're when employers specifically are using biometrically enabled technology to track time, the employees are clocking in and clocking out at least two, maybe even four times uh, per day. And this multiplicative um, nature of how the damages are calculated quickly it quickly makes it clear that this is one of those claims that you might want to consider settling early if you don't have a slam dunk to close it out. And another element, statute of limitations under BIPA is also in flux. So currently, there are a number of cases before the first district, well, one was in the first district, now it's before the Supreme Court, I'm showing you how fluid this is, another is in front of the second district. Um, the courts haven't really found a way to figure out what statute of limitations period applies. Under Illinois law, generally, the courts look to the statute itself to see what limitations it um, applies. And if that fails, they look to certain statutory provisions. When we're looking at uh, BIPA, most defense side attorneys have been arguing that the uh, statute of limitations period attributable to privacy torts, which is one year, um, should apply. There's another two-year um, statute of limitations argument to be made for uh, personal injuries. But what plaintiffs' counsel understandably are looking at are the maximum possible limit uh, term to cover the most, uh, you know, get the most class members as possible. And under Illinois law, if a statute does or a claim or any sort of uh, any sort of right of action does not specify what that limitation period is, you're looking at five years. So if we're looking at an employer with that example I gave before, four scans per day, 20 employees, even the lowest, uh, you know, lowest bar, the negligence bar at a thousand per violation, 260 days. And you're looking at five-year look-back period. Um, the damages can get very extreme and an order of magnitude that is almost uh, out of proportion to what you even paid for the system in the first place. And uh, the last but not least, um, the accrual and damage calculation issues are complicated by the fact that there is a disagreement right now that is being reviewed by our Supreme Court in the Cothron versus White Castle case. The Supreme, our Supreme Court is analyzing whether or not a violation or let's say a claim accrues on that first scan and that suffices or if a claim accrues on each and every scan that takes place. What this also means for your damages is that under Illinois' prior um, precedent, if you had that first scan of, you know, happen, let's say uh, five years ago, that would set the, you know, the time period for the claim accruing and it wouldn't expire for five years. But what plaintiffs' counsel are arguing is that it's a continuing violation type injury. They're saying that that $1,000, that $5,000 violation or liquidated damages penalty, that should apply for each and every scan that takes place. So again, going back to that example, you're going from $1,000 for one negligent scan, just under what plaintiffs want to $4,000 for that one employee for one negligent violation of BIPA. Um, so these are the major issues. And as you can tell, those issues on the litigation side are primarily just the result of the fact that uh, but there really wasn't an understanding of how this technology worked and what biometrics were. Um, but what that means is that when you're litigating one of these actions, there are a lot of unanswered questions. And it's better to be aware of where those are because you're going to have very different settlement and damage calculation schemes when you're considering whether or not it's a one, two, or five year look back period, and when you're considering whether or not you have to consider if it's damages multiplied by at one time or every single scan that occurs. Well, thanks, thanks, Drew. Um, that, that, that was a great, great summary. Um, so, uh, John, <laughs> we we have we have a tidal wave of litigation. Um, yes. We have mostly cases about employers' use of biometrics. We have a situation where it may even be more advantageous not to claim any actual damages uh, from a violation of BIPA. Some uh, some products out there in the marketplace are are not being offered in Illinois 
and where if they are, some sometimes features are are disabled in in Illinois. I'm guessing this isn't what the legislature had in mind. No, not at all. And that's why I wanted to emphasize the fact that this was voted on, you know, 14 years ago. This technology hadn't even been developed to the extent that it has now. And looking back at the Supreme Court decision in the uh, in the Six Flags case, um, you know, the court, I, I can't blame them. They, they looked to see what the legislative intent was. If we wanted to say actual damages, we could have said that. I don't think there would have been anybody objecting if that was requirement was put in the, in the, in the legislation. But but we didn't. We just said, you know, there's some things that, you know, this is this is our biometric information. <clears throat> there are certain rules you got to follow, and <clears throat> uh, if you don't follow them, you know, you're you, you're violating the law. Uh, but how we how we enforced it is is what was it at, at stake in that in that Supreme Court decision, and they 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 said, you know, this is not that hard for you to comply. Um, if the legislature really, you know, they, they say your legislative intent, even though you, you didn't really have the question in front of you when you, when you voted on it. So, um, that's, that's how it got passed. Now, um, and it was the ACLU, it, it, it wasn't the most powerful lobbying group. It's just that it seemed like a good idea for the, every legislator in the, in the general assembly, no one, and, and I, even though I voted for it, had no idea that this this was going to happen. Some of my own clients uh, got sued and uh, couldn't even uh, believe that this was the ramification. So the situation now, though, is in the Illinois General Assembly, one of the more uh, influential lobbying groups is the Illinois Trial Lawyers Association. And they um, have been monitoring efforts. There's been, I think, 12 pieces of legislation that have been introduced, if, if not more. Um, the ACLU is still adamant supportive of the of the bill and proud of the fact that we're the first in the, in the state uh, nation to do it but the uh, trial lawyers association would would um, really be the only entity that you could negotiate with to try to to tweak this law and that is uh, not they have, has not been successful uh, so far you, you talked earlier about the bipartisanship obviously when we when this bill was passed the Republican leaders supported it but um, that's changed because of the um, um, we would say unintended uh, litigation that's, that's flowed as a result of the way the bill was drafted. So it's probably not going to be uh, likely that this will be, since it's the law and supposedly one of the strongest in the, in the nation, it, there won't be a lot of major changes uh, soon, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect. Well, excellent. Um, and I, I would note as well that uh, where there's been more of a difference in terms of partisanship, uh, we've seen it in, in the different state legislation uh, on the private right of action, uh, that where we've had um, privacy laws that have passed, it, not, in, not just in the biometric space, but even beyond. Um, quite oftentimes, the, it, it, if Democrats want to get Republican support, it's almost always come at the, the expense of a private right of action. Um, and so... The, the laws, as we've seen in California and in, in, in um, many other states, are enforced exclusively by the AG's office. Um, and so yeah, that uh, certainly could be a, a partisan issue in trying to amend BIPA going forward. And uh, just I'm going to depart from BIPA for just, just one moment because we're talking about um, you know, legislation and the prospects for legislation. We had a question about you know, whether Illinois might enact a comprehensive data privacy law, as we've seen in uh, most notably California, but also in other states, you know, Colorado, Virginia, Connecticut. Um, and so and I can, I'll give you know, my thoughts on that. I think there's um, a couple of important issues here. One is, um, you know, will Illinois pass the, this the kind of law? And then two, you know, how much does it matter if Illinois does, does or does not? Um, and I think um, Illinois clearly cares about privacy more than most states. You know, I think if you, we'll talk about a few other privacy laws here in a moment, but privacy has, has clearly been an important issue in Illinois for, for several years. And it, there have been more passed here than in most places. So I'd say in that respect, the, the, the prospects um, might be fairly good. Um, 
but I think there is also this question: what what, what would it look like if it, it passed the law? And I, 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 as I said, I think that the, the the price of getting Republican support has typically been to not have a private right of action under the law. Um, so I, I think that would be a starting point. Is it? I think Illinois would likely uh, follow these other states we've seen and not have a private right of action. Um, but I, I think you have to also think about you know, how much does it matter if Illinois does or does not. Um, we're, as oftentimes happens in privacy, um, it, it, a state law can become a national standard. It's just a question of how important is that state and do, uh, do enough other states follow suit uh, to make it so it doesn't really make sense to differentiate between you know, doing you know, having customers or employees in one state versus in another one. You just decide at some point, we're just going to do this across the board because it just it, it's much more efficient that way, even though we're giving more privacy rights than we might have to legally give. Um, and so we, we're seeing enough states that have enacted something, and many other states have considered it. Uh, I've not heard that Illinois is particularly close on this, to be honest. Um, but we, we're seeing a lot of other states, you know, many of them being fairly larger states or at least mid-sized states, that uh, we, we may be on the verge of having of getting to, to that national standard. There's just a question about if Illinois would enact something that's different enough uh, than the other states. And I think the other effect is if there is – uh, if enforcement is by the AG's office, as is likely, uh, it, it creates the, the possibility of what is, uh, on the whole, a more active than most state AG's office uh, enforcing these privacy laws, you know, more, more active than we've seen in, in some other states. Um, certainly, if you have any thoughts on that, you know, John or Joe. Well, of course, it, what's interesting that people should remember that uh, every 10 years we, we have redistricting in the state, and it just so happens that every legislator is on the ballot. That's not always the case. And uh, every uh, uh, legislator is in a new district. And there's also uh, statewide elections for attorney general and governor. So um, in the timing of the General Assembly is um, uh, really to come back uh, after the inaugurations next January. There, there, there could be a different uh, mood uh, in, in light of what's happened with all of these uh, this litigation. There could be a mood, a different mood in light of what happens in other states. Uh, if only could, if the argument is that you know there's a competitive disadvantage to our constituents, that sort of thing, those would all be be factors. Um, I, I'm not suggesting that the that the trial lawyers run the entire general assembly, which is that they would have to be part of the discussion, just like the ACLU. Uh, would as well. And um, w but what other states do is certainly things that, I mean, there's 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 a number of organizations that share information about what the other states do, and, and that, that, that would be um, on the table. Um, the business community is obviously very well represented as well. Um, it, so far, the, the Democrats are super majorities in both chambers. That could change in, in, in this upcoming election that might affect the outcome for legislation next year. And if I had to add anything, um, you know, I'm biased. I'm on the defense side. I normally defending companies and private entities. But, uh, you know, when we're talking about competitive disadvantage, you know, BIPA, even though litigation has just started over the last, you know, eight or so years, um, it has actually led to penalizing major companies, major organizations. So um, you might have seen the headline that Facebook ended up being drawn into a BIPA um, BIPA case, and it ended up having to settle for $650 million um, for the use of the Facebook photo tagging feature. That case proceeded in California. And I'm not going to go into all the procedural quirks as to why, um, but, you know, that was, uh, you know, a strange you know, situation where it's an Illinois-based statute, there's extraterritorial concerns, yet somehow it's out in California. Um, basically, Facebook was trying to, you know, I think, get a strategic advantage, which didn't work out. And they went there. They thought that they would uh, somehow get less biased treatment in another court, and it actually ended up working against them. Um, one funny quirk about that case is that the initial settlement was for $550 million. The judge himself threw out that number, and he's the one who said this is such a small amount considering the amount of damages involved. And when he's talking about damages, he wasn't talking about the actual monetary or pecuniary damages. 
that judge was referring to the very real privacy interests that BIPA created. Um, so, you know, that's Facebook already getting dinged once. And then you can just imagine that there's a company who, in this new remote hybrid work environment, might be trepidatious about, you know, hiring employers, uh, employees that are in Illinois um, just because they might think, okay, well, maybe our systems or even our computer uses a fingerprint unlocking system. Uh, do we really want to go through the expense of, you know, being BIPA compliant and, you know, basically having to learn and track a whole new area of law in a state that we're not even headquartered to do that much business in? Um, so when I'm looking at um, the product offerings, I'm thinking about, comp you know, Illinois' comp uh, competitive uh, position compared to other states. I'm really thinking, you know, we're seeing other companies that have already been hit by that. And we are also, you know, I defended other entities who are, you know, drawn into this litigation. And many of them have no idea why they are being sued. And they also don't really understand the dynamics behind why BIPA was passed, it, passed in the first place. Yeah, thanks. And while we're, while we're looking, while they have, we have the crystal ball out and we're you know, looking to the future, a um, couple of thoughts I had about you know, where might this, where might litigation go in the future? Um, you know, the vast majority of cases uh, that we've seen under BIPA have been in the employment context, and they've they've involved the failure to obtain consent. I think one thing we have to think about going forward is what about applying BIPA where consent is much more difficult. There's a, a quickly give an anecdote. If you've seen the, the movie Minority Report, the old Tom Cruise movie, uh, Tom Cruise at one point steps into a mall in the future, and there's something done on him. That it looks like basically like an iris scan. And then it projects up, you know, all, all around him ads for products that are tailored exactly to him. Um, and so, then the, here's the interesting thing is that basic kind of thing could be done right now, is that you can do facial recognition scans on people. And even if you don't know exactly who they are, you know enough about them, you can, the facial recognition scan, you may know who they are, may not, it can certainly tell their demographics can tell, you know, their their gender, age, even mood, um, and and then project ads based on that, using the those you know, biometric uh, yeah, uh, that biometric information. Um, how in that kind of context, how would you ever obtain consent? Um, it, it is, it, it would be nearly impossible to to do with that kind of thing, and so we, we may see more of those kind of things going forward. Uh, where, where consent is more difficult. And then other, also the, the BIPA requirements that, it are, uh, that don't go to consent, you know, having a biometric policy, sharing a biometric information, potentially profiting from biometric information. We haven't seen that as often in the cases, but if the consent issue begins to be covered off more, particularly in the, in the employment context, the cases may migrate to those, those other ones. Uh, so... Uh, so let's let's uh, move on. We have our our uh, second uh, secret word question, and the secret word here is security. Uh, please click on security in the boy. It's uh, not saying one place. Uh, security and among the three choices here, and uh, click on that. Uh, do so quickly if you can. And we'll uh, move on to the, you know, the the next segment. Click on security. Okay. So I give everybody another maybe ten seconds or so. <clears throat> Click on security among the the choices here, and then we will uh, move on. Okay, last chance. Click on security. Okay, we're moving on. So BIPA has, has had national effects um, that we, we've see, there are other biometric privacy laws in other states. Uh, Texas enacted a law that was enacted right around the same time as, as a BIPA, uh, but it but is different. Um, and then uh, the uh, Washington State uh, enacted a law in 2017 uh, that is is really a little more close to the, the Texas law than to the Illinois uh, BIPA statute. 
you know, how do these these differ? Well, one, they, these other laws don't have a private right of action. Uh, so the enforcement is exclusively there by the attorney general. Um, and then they, there's not a distinction between biometric identifiers and biometric information, uh, which is a, a, an unusual, a, a different feature of Illinois, Illinois statute. Um, now, if, if these are the models out there, um, you know, the, there are other states that are considering, you know, uh, having a biometric privacy law. And I would note that, that some of those follow each of those different laws in, in some respects. Um, I would note that in particular, there's a New York state bill uh, that that is being under consideration uh, that would very closely mirror BIPA, and it, it has the private right of action. It has the statutory damages. It has the the dual um, uh, coverage of biometric identifiers and biometric information. Um, if a few big important states, you know, have a BIPA type law. BIPA could effectively become the national standard, uh, even outside of Illinois. Um, and then I would, would also note that um, biometrics are, are sometimes now covered in other laws. Uh, we've seen uh, there are a few of the, uh, the breach notice <laughs> statutes that, that cover biometric information as personal information. And then some of the privacy laws, uh, like, like uh, California CCPA, CPRA include biometrics expressly as personal information that's subject to the various privacy laws of or requirements under those those statutes. Um, so with that, we'll move off of BIPA. So we have we mentioned there are a few other privacy related laws in Illinois. One of them is uh, the Student Online Personal Protection Act. Uh, it was enacted more recently in in and effective in 2017, there were some significant amendments that were, were put into place last year. It is enforced by the Illinois Attorney General. Um, it has a more limited coverage. It's exclusively within the education space, but not exclusive to education in, uh, entities. So it, it covers public and private schools, but there are certain provisions of it that only apply in the public school context. Um, it also covers those who maintain student records for more than one school. Uh, so it covers some of those, those service providers, as well as other kinds of service providers that are deemed as operators. So operators of a website, online service application, they have actual knowledge that, that, that it's used primarily in K through 12 school purposes or is designed and marketed for those purposes. They also have uh, different requirements under uh, SOPA. And so what, what is covered information? Well, it's, it's defined you know, pretty broadly. So if you're within SOPA, you know, the personal information that's covered is you know, a, a very large amount of information that's identifiable to a particular individual. So I think you, you, you almost have to start with the, the presumption that it's, gonna, that it, it's personal information uh, and then figure out if it's, if it's not under that statute. Now I said there are, there are requirements. So there are separate requirements that, that cover those who are a school, and you, know, and you can see some of those listed here, and then other requirements that are specific to those operators of the online services, websites, uh, applications. You know, one of the things I would call out here particularly, and I think we'll probably cover this more uh, exhaustively in a, in a future webinar, but I would like to call out that the, the requirement about you know, listing the operators that a school uses and listing the operators subcontractors. I mean, that's an area where th that can be, there, there's usually a web of, of companies that are involved in that. And so maintaining an up-to-date list of that is, is going to be difficult, particularly on the subcontractor side. And <clears throat> as well as you know, for the contractors, you have to have their contracts available, or you, you may, depending on who you are. So um, th this may require a lot of effort on your part to, to put together so keep that in, in mind. Uh, and so, Drew, uh, another privacy law here in Illinois. All right, the Protecting Household Privacy Act. This one's very interesting, it's very new. It was actually signed um, into legislation back on August 27, 2021, and, but it went into effect January 1st this year. Um, and this is another, just like John had mentioned before in, in relation to BIPA, 
This passed unanimously. So this is a clear legislative intent um, that privacy is important uh, in Illinois. Um, what is protected? Now, this is very interesting. This protects data um, that is collected by personal household devices. Um, so I'm not going to get into the definition here, but personal household devices defined broadly. It's your smartphone, tablet, computer, anything that is in your environment that's collecting data and which a private entity um, would be receiving that data and storing or maybe using it for whatever purposes. It, it might not even be commercial, it might just be data that they maintain for how their systems are operated or what applications are used. Um, when we're talking about who this, uh, what duty is created and who has to actually comply with that duty, there are two classes of people that are specifically identified, and then there's another one that's kind of inferred. Um, so the law enforcement agencies basically cannot go to this third party or private entity and obtain your household private data um, without getting a warrant. So they have a number of uh, exceptions to not needing to get that warrant. Uh, the first two that are the most important, I think, is if there is an emergency and you're calling in and you need assistance from a law enforcement agency or law enforcement agents, um, then they don't need to go through all the steps to go to a court and get a search warrant. Um, but if there is an emergency involving a clear and present danger, that's another reason um, for them to go in and get the data, which could be your GPS location data or what have you, in order to locate you without waiting for a warrant. You could also give them consent, uh, enabling to, them to go to third parties and use that data for whatever reason. Um, and then last but not least, um, if we're talking about a warrant that they are they obtain during the course of an investigation and they've went through the court process, obviously that's an exception toward them not being able to obtain that data. Um, most interesting though, um, on the private entity side, if you're a private entity that collects that data, this actually imposes some security requirements that are somewhat vaguely defined. Um, the way the statute is worded, um, the private entity or third party company that has this data and is asked to provide it to a law enforcement agency, for example, they have to take reasonable measures to protect that data during the transmission process. And they also have to limit any production of that data to information specifically responsive to the law enforcement agency's request. So I think you can just imagine the litigation possibilities there where we're talking about like what is a reasonable protection of you know the data that they're transmitting did they transmit in a safe, secure way? Was it intercepted by a third party in the first place? And then we're talking about this production, uh, this production duty, the scope of whether or not they're actually producing data exceeding uh, what's specifically responsive to that agency request. Um, those are the two main parties. This 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 law is so new that there has been no <clears throat> litigation surrounding it yet. Um, so we'll continue monitoring it, but. Uh, for now, uh, this is just another example of how Illinois is somewhat taking a proactive approach to how these devices and anything else that can affect your privacy um, should be protected on the, in a proactive way. Thanks, Drew. Um, so we're going to shift a little bit. So we've been talking about Illinois has been a front runner on privacy issues, you know, the collection, sharing, use of, of personal information. Um, we're going to move on to cyber, where, you know, honestly, Illinois has been somewhat less active. Um, I mean, the one maybe most important area in, in cybersecurity where Illinois has passed a law is the Personal Information Pri Protection Act, which all 50 states have now enacted a breach notice law. Um, this is the Illinois version of it. Um, and Il the Cal first version of, of this of the law we saw in in the U.S. was in California, enacted in uh, 2003, effective in 2005. Um, there were a series of, of high-profile security incidents in 2005, and a number of states enacted laws that largely mirrored what we saw in California. Illinois was one of those, those states. Uh, it was uh, significantly amended in 2017. And so let's, let's kind of consider you know, what's unique about the Illinois law. Uh, well, for, for one thing, um, it has a broader definition of personal information than you see in a lot of states. Uh, it covers you know, medical information, health insurance information, biometrics. That's a, that's a recurring theme here in Illinois. Uh, but most of these breach notice laws don't cover that. Um, some do, but not most do not. Um, not all states have a requirement that you notify the state 
AG or other government agency of a security incident. Uh, Illinois does have that kind of requirement, uh, but it has a threshold. So they have to be more than 500 Illinois residents that are notified under that that uh, breach no, in that, that incident uh, under the law. Um, the Illinois statute, unlike some others, does not require notice only where there's a particular level of harm to the individuals. Um, but whereas a lot of states do that, you know, it has to be some some high, some risk of harm to the individuals arising from the incident in order to, to have to require notice. I would also notice some, that, note something there that I think an overlooked part of Illinois' law as well as uh, certain other states, and that's that it has requirements relating to data security. Uh, they have to maintain reasonable security measures and uh, are around the personal information and required by contract that recipients of that information, so like your service providers or business partners that receive that information, have to protect it to a certain level as well. You know, that can be important um, when you are not in a regulated industry where you're already doing this for some other reason. So like if you're in financial services, you're already doing this because of grand lease politely. If you're in healthcare, you're already doing it because of HIPAA. If you're a government contractor, you have uh, requirements uh, that, that relate to that. Um, but if you're not one of those, or if you have an entity that, that's not in, in covered by those laws, this may be a, a, a requirement where you didn't have one. So I think if you pay attention to those, uh, because this, this provides another way for an AG's office uh, to pursue a company after a security breach, whereas they, they could, if you didn't give notice or didn't give timely notice of the incident, they could go after you there. But they also could say, well, you know, this incident happened because you didn't have the reasonable security in place that you should have, and that's why, why we're going to bring bring the action. We've certainly seen that in, in Massachusetts. Um, so with, with that, look, Drew, let's, let's talk a little bit about you know, where if you're litigating, even beyond just, just BIPA, if you're, you're litigating privacy issues, security issues in Illinois, you know, what are some, some important <clears throat> issues, important things to keep in mind? All right. Um, so I'll cite to BIPA a couple of times as an example. But first of all, look at the definition of the statute. Um, look, you'll want to see if the type of data that or the type of information, the type of claim, the type of breach that occurred is covered um, by the statute itself. Um, we spoke before about how BIPA covers biometric data. Um, but one issue under BIPA is that they use two definitions to refer to that data. Uh, we spoke about this before, but the biometric, uh, it defines biometric data in the way that you would understand biometrics, fingerprints, iris prints, things like that. Biometric information, though, is also covered by the statute, which covers any information based on biometric data. So under BIPA, when you're thinking about what's covered, a number, it's really broadly applicable. Uh, another consideration, this is a definitional issue on the contract side. When you're getting slammed with a claim like this, one thing to consider is pulling up your insurance policies and actually look at their definitions for what claims are covered, as well as what their notice requirements are. Uh, so this is kind of touching back on what Jim was saying before. If you have, this is notice separate from the lawsuit itself. Many insurance policies will actually require you to provide them with some sort of notification when you've been served with a complaint or receive notice, and they may specifically def define what that notice consists of. Under some statutes, that notice may be provided by an enforcement agency or a consumer report. Um, but under BIPA, um, it would normally just be by service of a complaint. Uh, so keeping those in mind so you don't lose access to potential insurance defense down the line is very important. Um, and then when we're talking about discovery issues, I mean, I think this is where you know, Jim really, Jim's expertise comes into play. Um, because what we're talking about here is not just gathering the information, but you're trying to determine your weak points and what you need to shore up. So, you know, you're looking at who has the data, uh, what entities is it transmitted to? How do you get the information that's relevant to responding to discovery? Uh, do you have to go through technical manuals and other documents to kind of prove up your case that some sort of misrepresentation was made again, uh, uh, you know, as to what data was collected or the technical capabilities of your machinery? Um, and another thing to consider, when you're dealing with discovery, especially with privacy claims, um, many of them, especially on the BIPA side, they've been presented as class actions. Um, so you want to, it's not necessarily a discovery issue per se. Some people put this off until class certification, but certain claims like BIPA, for example, 
you never really get to the class certification st um, stage. You actually end up going to settlement before. And I don't know if we've mentioned this before, but there have been no BIPA cases that have gone to trial. So what we're looking at is you want to determine, uh, you want to do your own internal discovery to determine what your exposure is. What is the class size that you're dealing with? Those That's going to generate numbers that will enable you to know, okay, so we're looking at potential $5 million liability here. So when I go to the settlement table, uh, you know, what is our opening offer going to be? Uh, these considerations become very important on the class action side because you're going to sit there and you're going to say, okay, this number is not just what the settlement fund's going to be, but you also have to consider what's the attorney's cut. Plaintiff's counsel usually gets uh, in BIPA claims around 33 or 35% on top of off the top of whatever the settlement fund is. Then you have a class action incentive award. All these numbers come into play when they're looking at their bottom line. And I've dealt with enough plaintiff's counsel at this point that in some, time, in some ways they're not as focused on that per person recovery. You know, what they're focused on is a balance of things, but their reward is to get their attorney's fees covered as class counsel. Um, so when you're going through not just a class size determination, but also when you're preparing to go into um, any sort of settlement negotiations, you really want to know how much information you're going to need and how much, uh, let's say, how much exposure you have. Um, I guess I'm going to hit the last one really quickly. On the compliance issue side, we touched on this before. Just know what you need to put in your release and your notice in order to get protection. And then you also want to consider, is the release or notice you provide, does that cut off any prior liability or is it only perspective? I mean, that comes into play. Um, if you want to do a pickoff strategy, you know, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, OK, so we have a we have a class action complaint under Illinois law. If you're presented with a class action complaint, you can pick off the name plaintiff um, as long as you haven't uh, the motion for class certification hasn't been presented. So this involves analyzing the actual pleadings and determining, OK, so I will not be violating any law or any sort of uh, uh, legal precedent um, by picking off this plaintiff, and it will be difficult for this uh, plaintiff uh, counsel to find a replacement because I've already addressed it uh, on the release side. Uh, I classify that under compliance um, mainly because um, if, you did, if you were in compliance or came in compliance, this can really come into play to start to limit your exposure. Um, another consideration, and this is not here, but I guess this will be a bonus, Consider if you can if you can spread the pain to other people, <laughs> and by that that's a fancy way of saying are other tort feasors or violators liable under the statute. This is going back to that definitional um, section. If that statute says a collector is defined a certain way, a private entity is defined a certain way, someone who possesses or transmits that data or information is defined a certain way, that could implicate other vendors or companies that you deal with. And you're going to want to start considering contribution claims, third party claims, whether or not it's even worth it to pull some of them in because there might be contractual indemnity issues involved where you pull them into the case and then you find out that you have to indemnify them for all their attorney's fees and costs. So all these considerations on the litigation side, it's helpful to know these up front <laughs> so you can start working through them as you're preparing your defense, because especially with the BIPA claims, what we have found is many of these cases don't get litigated to summary judgment phase or even trial phase. Uh, what we're seeing the more experienced attorneys in this space do is just prepare for settlement immediately. You know, you can prepare your defense, but just be, re uh, just be ready, um, especially with some of these newer um, laws that have been passed. Some of these defenses are untested and it'll be years before you're tested. Um, so um, th those are just some practice tips that I hope are helpful for you in the future. No, thanks. Thanks, Drew. And, uh, uh, thanks to all of our panelists uh, today for you know, this really, really good information. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone who's uh, who's joined us. Uh, please complete and submit the survey that, that is going to display uh, at the end of the webinar here. And um, you know, come join us again for uh, additional cybersecurity and privacy uh, webinars. We're going to cover additional states. We've talked about California and Illinois now. Uh, we're going to look at some other states as well in the future. And if there are particular things you want to hear about, uh, reach out and let us let us know, and we'll we'll try and incorporate it into into our planning. Uh, with that, thank you very much, and we'll we'll see you on our next webinar.